Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Okay, we're getting our program started, and I'd like to introduce Bishop Joseph Coffey, Auxiliary Bishop for the Military. Let's hear it for him. He's going to lead us in an opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for today, because every day you give us is a great gift, a gift of life. We ask your blessings right now on Zachary King, our speaker, in thanksgiving for his absolutely amazing transformation and conversion, which we're going to hear about. We ask you to help us to always do our best to stay motivated in the defense of life in all stages. Help us when we grow weary. Help us to inspire others out of their lethargy or out of their indifference to life. Bless all the leaders of the pro-life movement in this country, locally, all those around the world. Help us to help those mothers in need to give them whatever they need to carry their babies to term. And for those who have made a terrible, terrible choice that they do regret, we ask you to help them to find that healing that comes from the church, especially through confession. So Lord, now be with us and we, as we listen to Zachary. And also we thank you, Lord, for the food which we shared and for the souls that faithfully parted through the mercy of God. Rest in peace, amen. amen. Thank you, Bishop Joe. By the way, he's a Philadelphian. I'm sort of a Philadelphian because I went to Villanova, but I grew up in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. Uh, and I'm proud of Pennsylvania. Uh, still one of the more godly states in America. But welcome here, all you wonderful priests, seminarians, deacons, and lay people. Uh, I understand we have about 70 persons here. It's at Rock Creek Knights of Columbus in Bethesda, Maryland, so welcome. Defend Life is sponsoring this. Defend Life was started way back in 1987, back in the previous millennium. We have one of the previous directors with us, Father Charles Sikorsky, the president of Divine Mercy University. Please stand up, Father Charles. I'm proud to say that I had something to do with recruiting him to the uh, pro-life movement. But then one day he said, after he became the director of Defend Life. See, I'm actually the first director and the fourth director. I had two interim directors. He was one of the two. Uh, one day he came to me and said, I decided I'm going to become a priest. You need to find a new director or something like that. So I've been a director since he went into the seminary. He's doing a fantastic job at Divine Mercy University. And thanks, Father Charles, for getting your other legionary priest here. If you haven't heard of Legionaries of Christ, look them up. They're doing fantastic work. I'd also like to thank Jerry Gillen, who recruited so many of you um, good people who are here today. Uh, we have 71, as I said a minute ago. I'd also particularly like to thank Missy Smith. Missy does it all. She arranged for so much of the food. She actually ran for Congress. She ran for Vice President. She's done it all. She's the mother of five. And uh, she, do, she really does it all. Lives here in Washington, D.C. Is trying to survive in Washington. <laughs> now, a couple of housekeeping things. All you priests, seminarians, and deacons, be sure to take this wonderful CD and play it. You know, some people like to play CDs on, uh, while they're driving. This is a great CD. And of course, here's the book. And the book is very much the same as a CD, but there's a few extra things in the book. So use, use both of them. There's a card, you see that card that says Defend Life on it? Okay, I want you to fill that out so we can keep in touch with you. Uh, and we're gonna have a drawing for a beautiful wood carving of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would somebody bring up one of those wood carvings, please? At the end of the program. So I'm sure there's many priests here who would be glad to uh, bless that beautiful wood carving made from olive wood in the Holy Land by one of the few remaining, regretfully, few remaining Christians there. Thank you, Kathy Roth, I wanna thank you. She's Canada's gift to the United States pro-life movement. She does it all too. 
After raising their own children, they took on three more children, were not able to adopt them, but at raising them. And uh, she's a saint. Her father was one of the founders of the pro-life movement in Canada. Uh, <clears throat> I think she might have a direct line to Justin Trudeau. She's going to get him straightened out. <laughs> so um, go to our website if you get a chance, defendlife.org. What our claim to fame is, we bring great pro-life speakers to parishes, schools, and whatever. The, uh, so many parishes are not doing anything pro-life. That's a travesty. So a way to inch into the pro-life movement is have a pro-life speaker come. And so many of the parishes here, like St. Paul's, Damascus, <clears throat> um, many others have had our speakers. They're the best speakers in the pro-life movement. We had a banner of all many of the speakers, but it self-destructed earlier action last night. All sorts of crazy things have happened. Some of our microphones didn't work. Keys got locked in cars. Keys disappeared. Well, why is that? Because Satan never sleeps, does he? No. Which leads us to our wonderful speaker, Zachary King. And we're going to move, put him right over here. Jennifer, I'd like to thank Jennifer McCoy, his traveling assistant. And they're all the way from the Wichita, Kansas area. Here's a, a few words about Zachary. He's a former high wizard in the Church of Satan. Yes, there is a Church of Satan. He can tell you all about it. Because he was as high as you can go in the Church of Satan. There's as many as five or six or seven high wizards. He was one of them. Uh, somebody in the quick question and answer period, tell him about his meeting with Bill Gates. Fascinating. There's another fascinating story about what happened in Detroit. But since the Blessed Mother appeared to him way back in 2008, I think, in January 2008, um, basically, he'll tell that story. But he's been on a mission, a mission to end abortion. And that's what he'll be talking about primarily after he tells his concerning story. Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Clergy, Bishop Joe, please welcome Zachary King. Everybody hear me okay? It's not on. Closer. Sorry. How about now? That's good. It's awesome, and I'm not in the room alone. I just figure one time Jack's going to wheel me in and say, you're on, and there'll be nobody here. <laughs> you don't know Jack like I know Jack. That ain't Jack Daniels, is it? <laughs> I knew Jack Daniels a few weeks ago. <laughs> it's wonderful to have so many priests in one spot. So much in persona Christi right here. And if I could be in persona Christi, I would, I would do it every day. So I got started when I was 10 years old. 10 years old. So I wanted to know if magic worked, magic real. Is that something I can really do? And I went to my Baptist preacher, because I was Baptist, and asked, can you do magic? No, magic's fake. Nothing you can do in magic. I asked my parents. They told me, don't waste my time. Now, we didn't have Harry Potter back then. If we'd had Harry Potter, pff, I'd have been hooked. Because Harry Potter is filled with real magic spells. J.K. Rowling's admitted that one third of her research went into occult books. She wanted real spells in all her books. So, no Harry Potter though. I was watching scary movies, witches, Satanists, things like that, and burning desire to do magic. Not quite sure what to do though. And then on the first day of the fifth grade, this kid came up to me and he said, meet me in the bathroom at the first break. Well, that's at 10.20. I'm a little naive kid. Sure, let's go to the bathroom at 1020. So I walk in. There's 49 other kids in there, boys and girls. We've got this new lighting system where it takes a special key to turn off the lights. Well, some genius child figured out if you put a paper clip in there and turn it off, you can do that. You can turn the light on and off. So some kid put a paper clip in there. They told us, chant this phrase a certain number of times. And if you do it right, the spirit of a burn victim will show up in the mirror. All right, let's try that. Now, what we were doing was a spell, not a game. And the 
burn victim is really a demon. Flicked off the lights, chanted the phrase, scary face appeared, 49 screaming kids ran out of the bathroom. One idiot, I can call him an idiot because it was me, stayed in the bathroom thinking this is the coolest thing ever. I did this. I said the phrase. I did the chant. I made the face appear. I'm going to do this every day. So I started doing it every day, and eventually, it didn't take long, kids got hurt. I don't mean like bumped and bruised hurt. I mean broken arm, broken leg hurt. So they sent notes home. And everybody had to take a note home to their parents, get their parents to sign it, said that if your child is caught playing this game, they'll be suspended from school for three days. I had to take this up to my dad. My dad had been a sniper in the Marines. He had a usual loving tone about everything he said. And in his usual loving tone, he asked, have you been playing this game? <laughs> Being terrified of my dad as I was, I told him the absolute truth, no. <laughs> so that I wouldn't get caught at school and get suspended for three days, because if that happened, I wouldn't be here to tell you the story. I started playing it at home. But when I played it at school, I did it once a day. Now, I get up in the morning, I play the game. I go to the bathroom, I play the game. I brush my teeth, I play the game. You know, I wash my face, I play the game. I go have breakfast, I come back, I play the game. I brush my teeth again, I play the game. You know, I'm playing the game 10 times before I go to school. When I get home from school, my parents aren't home. You know, they've got jobs. So I'm playing the game 25, 35, 45, 50 times a day. And every time I play it, I see this face. Now, I'm not positive this is magic, but it might be. And then at the same time as that, I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm doing campaigns every weekend. I'm always the wizard or the sorcerer with that. And I love that, and the magic always works in that, but that's a game. You know, I mean, my, my, the roll of my die is always lucky. I'm always getting 16s or higher, which is what I need for my magic spells to work. And eventually it occurs to me, you know, I wonder if I could do a magic spell in real life. I mean, parents don't know everything. Adults aren't always right. Maybe I could do a magic spell in real life and see what happens. So I figured I don't want to get somebody hurt or in trouble. I just want some cash. So I did a spell for money. And the next day, I went out and I found a can of tennis balls with a $5 bill in it. This is 1970, 1976. So the 1970s, the things that interested me the most were comic books, and they were 15 to 20 cents, candy bars, which were also 15 to 20 cents, and penny candy, which was a penny. Five dollars, that's a lot, but I'm gonna try it again, because maybe somebody had to find that can of tennis balls. So I did the spell the next week, and I found a $10 bill on the side of the road. I'm like, all right, this is better, $15, eight days, but that still could have been a coincidence. So I did it one more time. This time I did it in the bathroom at home. And I did my spell, I stopped halfway in, and I did the Bloody Mary chant. And then I got the demonic face. And then I made sure that face knew I was doing a spell for money. Finished out my spell, and the next day, I went about playing, and something caught my eye off in the distance. I ran off and I found what looked like Monopoly money rolled up tight in rubber bands. So I just stuck that in my pocket and went about playing. Later that night, everybody's in bed asleep. I'm in bed, I got the sheet pulled up over my head and a flashlight in my mouth, unraveling my rubber band to see what kind of treasure I got. Well, I'd never seen, you know, it looked like Monopoly money because I'd never seen a $100 bill. And when I unraveled them all, I had 10 $100 bills. So I'm worth a thousand bucks, 1976. Everything that I want is dirt cheap. And how many people think that I went to my parents and my Baptist preacher and said, hey, guess what, you were wrong. Magic works, I did a spell, I'm worth a thousand bucks. Anybody think I said that? No. 
Yeah, that was me. I was like, knowledge is power. I know something you don't know. I could do this every day. Now, my thought was, my number one car, what I really wanted was a Lamborghini Countach. So I thought, if I did this for 220 days in a row, I could buy a Lamborghini Countach. Now, I'm thinking of this from a 10-year-old's perspective. I'm not thinking, I'm going to have to get insurance on that. I'm going to have to get to the Lamborghini store. My dad's going to have to take me. My dad drives like an old man. I'm trying to look cool in my Lamborghini Countach while my dad you know, floors it at 30 miles an hour all the way home. So I would have been so embarrassed at that. But, and I would also have to explain to my dad why I have $220,000. You know, I'm not thinking of any of those things. I'm just thinking, I want the Lamborghini Countach. Or, you know, if I didn't buy the Countach, I could still do this spell for three years and be a millionaire, which it, I was successful. I got $1,000. You know, I got $5, $10, and 1000 Life is good for me. You know, I was able to buy anything I wanted, which, you know, most stuff I wanted was really dirt cheap anyway. But, you know, back then, you know, like the Double Kiss Alive album was six ninety nine. I'm aging myself now, I know. But, you know, I'm, I'm doing this magic every day. Every day I'm doing something. When I was 11 years old, I became the victim of a sexual assault at school at the hands of a female teacher. Uh, she told me I liked it, it was my idea, I wanted to do it. And if I tell anybody, I'll be suspended or expelled, and I'll go to prison, my parents will disown me. Well, why would she lie to me? She's a teacher. So the only thing I could do to make me feel better was delve further into magic. Magic gave me comfort and solace. So that's what I did. At 12 years old, now remember, I, I was playing D&D when I was 10. So at 12 years old, there was a kid that used to play with us when we were 10 years old, and he disappeared. He stopped going to school. And we thought he moved away. And it turned out that he was being homeschooled. Yes, Satanist homeschool. And this little 12-year-old kid was a recruiter. He came to my, my group of kids, my group of friends, and he said, hey, there's another group out there that plays D&D &D every weekend. They believe magic is real. Who wants to check them out? Well, I knew magic works. I mean, I'm not bragging to anybody. I just always have whatever I want. So I went and checked them out. Now, at my house, my mom give you three meals a day and a snack if she's in a good mood. But over there, and you, you're going to eat healthy. Even your snack is going to be healthy. But over there, you want to live on pizza? You can have it. Burgers? Fine. Fries every day? Okay. Snicker bars and chips? Yeah, do that. Why not? So I could eat anything I wanted any time I wanted. Now, I found out that if you're trying to eat a big meal, and you're not quite sure if you can, if you smoke a joint, suddenly you can. You know what goes great with a big meal afterwards? A cigarette. You know what goes great with a, a meal? A beer or a glass of wine, you know, or other illegal drugs. Um, I was told that what happened to me when I was 11 was atrocious and should have never happened, but now I can get my power back. Anybody in here ever lose their power? I got bad news for you. You never had it. We don't have power. But I believe the lie. You know, Satan gives you this nice box with a bow on it and glitter and neon lights, and it's so beautiful. And he tells you not to inspect it too closely, though. Because, you know, if you open it up, it's filled with gold bars. But again, don't inspect it too closely. Because, you know, if you inspect it too closely, you'll notice that that's aluminum foil, and underneath it is dog poop. But don't inspect it too closely, and you won't see any of that. You'll see the glittery box, and it's bright and shiny, you know, and you can have anything you want as long as you come worship me. Well, you know, in the Baptist church, they taught us that Jesus defeated Satan on the cross 2,000 years ago, and there's no reason to fear him. And 
Here, here's a startling revelation. That you, you'll find this shocking. Satan is afraid of the Baptist church. Now, doesn't it seem odd that Satan attacked God on his turf, but he's afraid of the Baptist church? That didn't quite make sense to me after I found that out, but I never heard those verses when I was a Baptist. So I'm thinking this place is really fun. I can do anything I want. I'm having a great time. I don't really know who these people are, but they're always there for me. No matter what happens to me, I can always go there for support. You know, my parents and God were the no police. Dad, the Moody Blues are coming to town. Can I go see them? No. Dad, there's a new movie coming out Friday. Can I go see it? No. Dad, no. Eventually, you just look at my dad. No. But anything I wanted to do there, I could men mention it and I could go. We were always going to see new movies, concerts, events. Now also at, during this time, they're telling me that they're gonna put me in porn. And that if I feel uncomfortable, I can back out. Nobody can make me do anything. No one can tell me no. So they made me a porn star for four and a half years where I think I'm on top of the world. I'm getting to have sex at 12 years old, which all the kids in school were bragging they were having sex, but none of, not everybody was making up stories mm -hmm. except me. I wasn't bragging about it because I didn't want to get caught. I knew that I'd be in trouble if I was caught. So I'm having a good time doing it. Now, I'm not realizing that every time I have sex, I'm being re-victimized. You know, I'm having sex with other kids. I'm having sex with adults. I'm having sex with pedophiles. I didn't realize that till I was about 19 or 20 and I had to go to counseling for a while. And that'll put a hurting on your mind and your soul. This kid came up to me, his older kid, and he said, hey, you know you're in a satanic coven, right? And he took off running. And I just laughed it off. But after a couple of weeks, that kind of bothered me. So I walked up to an adult that I knew and I said, hey, I got something. You're going to laugh. I heard this was a satanic coven. Crazy, right? And he said, it is. And my heart sunk into my stomach. And I said, I I'm, I'm not a member, am I? No. Would you like to be? You know, and so many people ask me now, you know, like, why would you join a satanic coven? Well, because I was addicted to pornography. You had to be 18 to buy porn. I was 12. I smoked cigarettes every day that you got to be 19 to buy. I was still 12. I was drinking alcohol almost every day, but definitely on the weekend. You got to be 21 to buy booze. I'm still 12. And I'm on every illegal drug I can possibly think of. And I don't know where to get those except at my coven. I'm having sex during the week, mostly on the weekend. It's being filmed. If I quit these guys, I'm going to lose all my privileges. I won't be able to get any of this stuff. Satan had me. He knew what to reel me in with. And he did it very slowly. I, I was the, the frog in the pot. And I thought I was on top of the world. So yeah, what do I have to do? How many steps are there? There's 13 steps to joining a satanic coven. I had done almost all of them already. All I had left to do was slice my left thumb, bleed onto a document, and sign it in three places in my blood. The blood of Jesus washes away all sin, but not mine. And I signed that. Jesus died for everybody, but not me. And I signed that. 
On the fifth page of a five-page document, I agreed to sell my soul to the devil. Does anybody believe you can sell your soul to the devil? Yes. Yeah. yes. No hands. No. Well, somebody in front of me is saying yes. 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 Father Mike. My cousin did. Yes. Okay. Um, can anyone in here legally sell me somebody else's car? Why not? It doesn't belong to you. That's the same reason you can't sell your soul. It doesn't belong to you. You may have heard God died for you. Jesus paid the ultimate price for your soul. You can't loan it, you can't lease it, and you certainly can't sell it. Now, Satan will tell you that you sold it to him and he owns it and he's got your soul. All you've got to do to quote unquote get your soul back is go to confession. What you've done is given your will to the devil and you need to give your will back to God. But Satan, you might have heard, is a liar. If Satan tells you good morning, get a second opinion. <laughs> but I was 13 years old and I knew it all. If you wanted to solve the world's problems, you should have come to me. I had all the answers at 13. I knew I was right. I agreed to do this. I signed a document, three places. I showed up at a coven meeting. I'm in a white robe. They baptize you full submersion in a vat of human blood, pig's blood, and human urine. But come up out of that, you go in another room, take a shower, come out in a black robe. It signifies being baptized in a world of darkness. You sit in a chair and they hand you a wheel with a crucifix in it. They read the document you signed the night before. You spin the crucifix upside down. That's human sacrifice. And you break the, out, the arms downward, denouncing Christ. And what you're left with looks like a peace sign. Then they intertwine the document you signed with that. They say it goes into a vault and your soul is forever tied to that. And when you die, you're gonna burn in hell. But I wasn't really positive the whole time I was a Satanist that hell was real. I wasn't positive that God was real. Not really positive for a while that Satan was real. And eventually that became a reality. So if he's real, then God has to be real. But, you know, early on, I was enjoying myself, full-blown Satanist at 13. Somebody told me a few years ago that my talk was ideal for 15 and older. Well, my problem with that statement is that by the time I was 15, I smoked cigarettes like a chimney. I was addicted to a lot of different drugs. I was an alcoholic. I was addicted to porn. I had broken all 10 commandments, including murder. And now I'm old enough to hear my own talk. Uh, I'm not saying that every child is as bad as me, but if your child has access to the internet, they've seen things that you probably haven't seen. You've got to talk to your kids in a language that they get, that they understand, and you can't be embarrassed or ashamed because if they don't get the answer from you, they're going to go to the internet where everything is truth, right? All the right answers are on the internet. They don't lie to you anywhere. They don't show you things you shouldn't see. Or they're going to go to their friends who are just as dumb as they are. And they're going to get incorrect information. It may be hard for you to have this conversation, but at least they're going to get Catholic answers. And they're going to get the correct ones, and they're going to get your perspective. I didn't have that growing up. My parents never had the sex talk with me. They'll never have grandkids. That was a joke. <laughs> so 
I did my first assisted abortion when I was 14 years old, three months before turning 15. I have two different CDs on my merchandise table. Both of them are my testimony. One of them is Adoratio 2014. It's a talk I gave in France. It's all ages. There's another one for We Wrestle Not Against Flesh and Blood. I gave that in around Chicago in 2011. It's a very adult talk. And it's adult because I go into graphic detail, which is what they asked me for, of my first abortion. I'll spare you all the graphic detail. Just know that I did one. Um, I continued until I graduated from high school. I was then going to go off to college. And I thought, this is before the internet. How am I going to find a satanic coven? And they're not going to advertise it in the town square. What am I going to do? A lot of things back then were advertised in swingers magazines. And that's what I thought I was going to have to do. But I didn't have to do that because they advertised it in the town square. We had the student union at school. It was open every Wednesday. And every Wednesday, there would be like the Republican, the Democrat student union, and the Baptist and the Catholic student union, and the Wiccan and the Satanist student union. So I started going to those meetings. And this is a bunch of kids away from home for the first time, no adult supervision. And they think Satan is all about getting high, getting drunk, having sex. I've been doing that since I was 12. I don't need a satanic coven for that. And these guys are making up spells on the spot. You know, if I do this and this, then this will happen. Well, that's not really a spell. And then we go to these meetings on Saturday to discuss whatever satanic thing they, they can think of. And then Sunday, guess what they do? They go to church. They go and worship God. And there's no conflict of interest in their mind that they're worshiping the devil on Saturday and worshiping God on Sunday because this Satanism thing is just a fad. It's just a, a clubhouse. It's a place to go have fun, get your drunk on. And then Sunday we go to church. Well, that's not what I want. I heard there was a satanic coven out there to rule the world. I wanted to rule the world. I was a little nerdy kid when I was growing up. I'm, I was still a nerdy kid then. And ruling the world, sign me up. They signed me up for the World Church of Satan or Satan's World Church. Two different names, same coven. I went to the first meeting. It was in a warehouse the size of a super Walmart. There's about 10,000 people in there having a party. I'm walking through. I'm very interested in everything that's going on. Now, let's go back to me being 13 and at a sleepover. One night I woke up, it was about 3 o'clock in the morning. I got up to go to the bathroom, get a drink of water. There was this guy walking through the house, looked like a member of KISS, wearing a tuxedo. Corpse paint on his face, top hat, and a wand. I saw that, and he looked at me and winked at me and kept going. I thought, that's cool. So the next day I asked, who was this guy? Like, that didn't happen, you dreamed it. All right, the parents are going to lie to me, or these people are now going to lie to me. I'll find out one day. Well, one day happened when I was 18. I was at this party, and I saw a different guy, but same look. And I just grabbed somebody next to me, and I said, who is that? What is that? How can I do that? And they said, well, who ran your coven? I said, our coven was huge. It was 120 to 150 members at any given time. We had 13 high priests and priestesses. And he said, well, we have over 1 million members worldwide. And we're run by a CEO and board of directors. And then we have people that are the official magic practitioners. Now, in my first coven, everybody wore the black robe. So black robe with a red inverted pentagram on it. Then there was a red robe with a black inventor pentagram, and that was the official magic practitioner. That's what I wanted to be, and that's what I got to be. 
So I was always wearing the red robe. They told me that the high wizard does the official magic. All right, that's pretty awesome. So I found out that that was the high wizard. And I thought, how can I do that? And they said they didn't know, but that you had to get Satan's attention. OK. Well, I knew from my previous coven that abortion gets the, Satan's attention. Mm. You know, you need stuff done, and you can't get it done any other way. You have to do a hex. And if you're going to do a hex, you have to do an abortion. Mm. You got to give Satan something that he wants so that he'll give you something that you want. It seemed like a fair trade. And my first one, they told me I was going to do an abortion, and I said, cool. And I went home, and I looked up the word abortion. My dictionary was so old, the word wasn't in there. I went to the library, and I found two books, really thick books, said abortion on the side of them. Now, I, went, I made it through school on Cliff Notes, so I wasn't going to read this giant book just to get a definition of abortion. Now, I knew that my parents whispered the word one time, so I knew it was a dirty word. I still believe that abortion is the dirtiest word there is. So not knowing what it was, I went back to my coven and said, hey, you know, I was told I had to do an abortion, but I don't know what that means. And they said, oh, you're killing a baby in the womb. I was like, is that legal? Oh, yeah, in the womb legal, out of the womb murder. So fast forward, I'm now 18 years old. I hook in with the group that's doing the abortions the Satanists that are doing them, because I'm good at it. Now, as a high wizard or as, as, as a magic practitioner, you need to get blood on your hands, whether it's the babies or the mothers. You're not actually doing the killing. But it is my belief that everyone that is at that abortion clinic is equally responsible for the death of that baby. So if you're the receptionist out in the hall, you're responsible. If you're the counselor, you're responsible. If you mow their grass so it looks presentable when people come there, you're responsible. The security guard in the parking lot, he's responsible. Everybody shares in that responsibility. So I got blood on my hands. I was just as responsible as the abortion doctor. So I did a few more abortions. When I was 21 years old, I got this notice in the mail that I was being called before the CEO and board of directors. And a lot of people that that happens to, they're never seen or heard from again. I thought, I ain't going out like no sucker. So there's a two week cooling off period in Florida to buy a handgun. I bought the handgun. I bought a bunch of ammo. I thought, try and take me out, see what happens. And they're going to be reading about me in the news. I show up at this meeting, and instead they call me into this room. There's a black curtain on the wall, and they remove that. And there's about nine different costumes on the wall, different ways of basically a tuxedo. And corpse paint on the face and different ways you can apply it. And they hand me this really hokey handbook. It's called the High Wizard Handbook. And they tell me that Satan has handpicked me to be the next High Wizard. And it's a big deal because I'm only 21 years old. And at that time, that was the youngest a High Wizard had ever been chosen. And I opened up the handbook, and on the first page it says, nobody can tell you what to do. This is the job for me. <laughs> now, you mean... If somebody hires my coven, pays them a million dollars for me to do a spell, I can say no? Yeah, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. If somebody tries to hire you for a spell and you're not comfortable with it, or you don't want to do it, for any reason, you don't have to. And my belief was, if you paid your money, you deserve to get what you hired me for. And I only turned down one person for a spell in my entire time as a high wizard. 
these people hired me, they tried to hire me to put a spell, to do a spell so that the pathways would be open for the assassination of a pope. And I don't think I even thought about it. I just said no. And they asked me if I was Catholic, and I laughed and said I was a Satanist. And I don't know, there was just something about the Catholic Church that to me seemed formidable. And they seemed like, I mean, I wasn't scared of anybody. I wasn't even scared of God. But something about messing with an institution that's that old, I thought, no, oh, that might be a bad idea. You know, there's so many priests. I mean, like tens of thousands of priests. I'm one high wizard. You know, if they decide to do something against me, hmm, that could go poorly. So I, I didn't take the job. It's the only job I never took. Every other job, though, I helped 1,200 rock stars become rock stars. I helped them sell their souls, make them famous. And that's with, through the, the Illuminati and then working through me. I totally did 146 assisted abortions. I split over 100 churches. I attempted 149 abortions. I had three abortions that failed. Finally, when I had the third one fail, I looked up what was causing these failures. I couldn't figure it out because, I mean, every time I tried to kill a baby, I was able to. But these three times, on the last one, I showed up at the clinic. I have an entourage that's with me. There's a satanic biker gang on my side of the street. And on the other side are these people. It's a pretty large number, 20, 30 people over there, walking around very quietly, praying Jesus ropes, Jesus chains, prayer beads, worry beads, whatever you want to call them. And the people on this side of the street are flicking cigarettes over there, flipping them off, mooning them, bearing their breasts, cussing them out. It's kind of really disproportionate. I mean, that this side is being so rude, and the other side is just being quiet, not really doing anything. It's kind of walking around, milling around. I walked inside. I had to go upstairs. And everybody's ready for the abortion. Everything is ready to go. And we hear chanting outside. Well, we walked over to the window to see what they're chanting. We're Satanists. We chant it all the time. And we can't quite make it out. But these windows are big jealousy windows. You can use a hand crank and open them up. So we did that to listen to what are they chanting. And not quite sure what it is, so I repeat back what I'm hearing. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. My handler says, Holy Mary, Mother of God, and we burst out laughing because we thought, you know, God is hella old. Who could his mom possibly be? She's got to really be old. And we just laughed it off. And we cranked the window back shut, and everybody takes their places. Doctor gets ready, starts up his procedure, and he says, whoa. You're not even dilated. I don't even know what that means. I don't, I don't, I don't, at that time, didn't know medical terms at all. And, you know, he says, you know, we're not ready to do the abortion. You know, can I come back like six or eight hours from now or can I come back tomorrow? No, I can't. I'm, I'm going someplace else in a couple of hours and tomorrow I'm going to be in a different state. And the woman's screaming, you know, the baby's in the birth canal, what are you doing? Get going, get the show on the road. You know, and the doctor is like, the doc, you know, the baby's not in the birth canal. There's nothing happening. You're not ready to have this abortion. Now this woman is what's called a breeder. She gets pregnant intentionally to abort it. 
She's had nine or ten at this time. So, and she does this so she gets a higher position in the coven. So the, the doctor again says, you're not ready. We're not going to do this today. She's screaming that the baby's in the birth canal. She asked me if this is my first rodeo too. And I, I said, no, I, I've done this quite a bit, but I'm not a doctor. I couldn't say if you're ready. She goes, well, check. I said, I, I wouldn't know what I'm checking for. And she yells at the doctor again. Now she's cussing both of us out. We're just having a quiet conversation between us. And suddenly we hear a baby cry. And we look down, the baby came out. Apparently it was in the birth canal. Now a social worker and an attorney come in that work with the nurse. They get the baby ready for an adoption. And it's going to go to a good family, not to a Satanist family. We don't want the baby. And I leave. And months later, I'm in an office and I have the secretary poll all the high wizards that have failed in an abortion. What is the common thread? And I'm looking at all these reports, and every report is Jesus chain, Jesus rope, worry beads, worry chain, life chain. But they're all done in the daytime during regular business hours. No one ever called it a rosary. If I'd have seen 15 failed reports and all of them said rosary, that would have tipped me off. But somebody must have blocked our minds in some way and made it so none of us knew that the proper term was rosary. So I'm going through living my life the way that I think I'm supposed to. But, you know, I equate sinning all you want to working in a candy store. Not like a one in the mall, but like a freestanding building, a building that's got thousands or tens of thousands of types of candy in it. Well, you know, when you're the manager and it's your first day on the job, you're wondering, how long is it going to take you to try every piece of candy? Now, not the licorice, because nobody wants that. So... <laughs> You're going to try to sin all you can, but there are some sins that are disgusting that you never want to try. When you're after six, six months, you've tried every piece of candy you wanted to try. And after a year, you've tried the licorice too. You tried the sins you said you'd never do out of boredom because you've tried everything else. You know, and after three years, a new candy bar comes out. And you're all excited, and you rip off the wrapper, and it's the same old candy bar. It's just a different wrapper. Crack cocaine comes out. Oh, my gosh, there's a new drug. And you try it, and after you're done smoking it, you realize, wait a minute, this was still cocaine. And after five or six years, you wonder why your boss can't create new sin. How come there's nothing new under the sun? Eight or nine years later, your job sucks. Your girlfriend, you dumped her because she smells like the candy store. And every day you feel like you should burn your clothes because they all smell like the candy store. You're expected to sin because you've always done it. You have to put on a show because you're the high wizard. This job sucks. But you know that if you want to get out, you can commit suicide. You can die of natural causes, or you can be murdered. Remember when I signed my soul away to the devil? Well, that means I'm going to go to hell when I die. At this time, I'm convinced hell is real. I don't want to go there. I'm good. So I think I've got to escape. I've got $87 million in the bank. It's not mine. It belongs to my coven. It's there for show. I drive a Lamborghini Diablo. It's not my Lamborghini Countach, but it's still a Lamborghini. But I don't own it. It belongs to somebody else. They let me borrow it. My real car is a Nissan Sentra. I wear really nice clothes when I'm dressed as the High Wizard. 
But my clothes that I'm the most happiest in are like my Metallica t-shirts, pair of cutoffs, pair of flip-flops. But most people that really know me don't see any of that of me. They see the high wizard me. I make a doctor's appointment at a satanic doctor. Because you're watched all the time. Everything you do is under scrutiny. We want to make sure that you're always complying with who you are. I make my appointment and I drive there. I've pilfered some money out of my bank account. And I drove there, but I didn't get off the exit. I kept going. I drove till I ran out of gas. I cut up my credit cards so no one could trace me that way. And I got caught a Greyhound bus to Canada. Because for some reason, I thought Satan wouldn't be there. <laughs> now I'm pretty sure that Satan is running Canada. <laughs> but I got rejected at the border. They told me that I could go anywhere in the United States. Greyhound takes you. I did the Protestant thing. I opened up an atlas, closed my eyes, put my finger down, said, oh, I'm going to Oklahoma. Okay. So Oklahoma is like the belt buckle in the Bible belt. And you cannot do magic out in public. It's a really bad idea. So you can do magic there if it's in your own house, in your bedroom with the door closed, and no one knows you're doing it. So I did that. And I was addicted to magic. I couldn't stop that. I didn't join a coven. I didn't dress as a high wizard anymore. But I still did magic. I stayed there for about three years. Part of that, I was living off the grid. Then I bought a car, and I tried to make it into Canada again. And I got rejected at the border again. Driving back across the US, somebody told me there's a border crossing near Vermont. And if you drive that way, there's no border guard there. That's the way I'm going to go. So I'm driving that way. I'm about two hours away from the border. And I am suddenly so sleepy, I'm afraid I'm going to crash the car. So I pull into a rest stop, and I take a nap. I'm only two hours away. I can make it. I just need a short nap first. When I woke up, it was the next day. Apparently, I was more tired than I thought. Not a problem. I'm two hours away. So I drive till I get there. It's two hours. I cross the border, and this border guard pulls me over. And then he explains to me for the next three hours while he searches my car inside and out, top to bottom, that he's been trying to get this job for three years. And today is his very first day on the job. And even as a Satanist, I recognize God's got a sense of humor. I'm worth $18 and I have half a tank of gas. And I drove to Burlington, Vermont. I got a job my first day as a dishwasher. I eventually was head of security. Then I moved into another bar. I was their GM. Then I went into retail. I worked Sunglass Hut, Finish Line, Piercing Pagoda eventually. Piercing Pagoda in this mall. In one mall I worked in, it was an inline store. In the other mall, it was the largest kiosk in the mall. The night before, I did a magic spell. Next day, I went into work. This woman came up. She wanted to buy a pair of gold hoop earrings. I sell her the perfect pair. I'm about to close the deal. Just before I can close it, she goes, you know, actually, I'm shopping with my daughter. When I'm done, I'll come back and I'll buy them. Now, for you men that don't understand woman speak, when a woman says that, what she means is, I'm going to go find it cheaper someplace else. But she said it, and she had an honest face. I knew she was coming back. And right as rain, three hours later, she was back buying the earrings. And we were done with the transaction. I handed her the receipt, and I said, we're having a promotion right now, and if you call the 800 number on this receipt and take a survey, you might win $1,000. She took the receipt, and she goes, that's great. I've got something for you, too. And she reached in her purse, and I thought, ah, she's going to pull out a Jack Chick pamphlet, tell me that I'm sinning, 
blah, 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 and this is what you got to do, and God will forgive you, and all this stuff. And, you know, I've dealt with these evangelical types before. You cannot be totally honest with them. You cannot say, I sold my soul when I was 13 years old, and I don't have this option, because they'll follow you home evangelizing to you. <laughs> so I know better than to say that. I'll just promise that I'm going to read whatever she says, and I may or may not read it. I'm going to be like the devil. I'm going to be 99% truth and 1% lie. You know, that 1% is what negates the whole thing, but, you know, it'll sound convincing. I stick my hand out and say, sure, I'll take it. But instead of a Jack Chick pamphlet, she pulls out this gold-colored, worthless piece of tin. Now, I recognize cheap jewelry because I sell it, and what she's got is cheap. I mean, like, with, if you used a Coke can to make one of these, you could probably make a 1,000. It's cheap. It's thin. There's not much to it. It's just gold-colored. So what? And then she says the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Now, I partied with rock stars. You give somebody that can write a song or a poem unlimited alcohol and drugs, and they will say some weird stuff. My example for this, the number one song, I think it was 1999, was Bow It to Bob by Kid Rock. Now, this was his breakout song. This is the first song he ever came out with, and this is probably the best song he ever came out with. And this song made him a millionaire and made him famous and made him a rock god. The chorus to this song is, bow to ba, to dang to dang, diggy diggy, up jumps the boogie. That's the best you got? <laughs> that was it? That made you a rock star? Now we laugh, but we made that song number one for almost a year. What she said was weirder than that. She said, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. And I thought, Blessed Mother, Isis, <laughs> Gaia. I grew up Baptist. We don't have any nicknames for Mary. We only have one. We got Mary. You know what she did? She gave birth to Jesus. You know what else she did? Nothing. We didn't hear about any of the other stories. Fleeing to Egypt, didn't hear that story. Jesus turned water to wine at the wedding of Cana. We didn't hear about it because the Baptists don't believe in drinking. Never heard that story. We just heard about Christmas. So then she says it's very powerful. Now there's generally between two and five high wizards in the world. The number could be as low as one or as high as 10. So that means at one time, I could have been the only high wizard out of seven billion people. That is a power trip and a half. And you're trying to tell me this little worthless gold colored piece of tin is powerful? No, 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 no. This isn't more powerful than me. There's no power, no mystique to this. This can't touch me. This can't do anything to me. I stick my hand out. Because I'm going to show her. I'm going to grab it in my hand. I'm going to feel of it. I'm going to know that there's nothing to it. I don't feel anything. This didn't do anything to me. Your God is useless. And I'm going to toss it on my floor or slam it on my counter. And if she gets mad and wants to return the jewelry and get her money back, good, do that. I don't need your money that bad. You want to call my manager, the regional, and tell her that I'm rude and complain? Do that. She'll never believe you. I make my days, my months, my quarters, and my year. I'm the best manager. I'm the best salesman in this region. No one will ever believe I was rude to somebody. I open my hand up, and she drops it in my hand. I clench my fist around it, all ready to tell her these things until I clench my fist around it until I clench my fist around a blessed, miraculous metal. And suddenly, my store and my mall completely disappear. They're gone. I'm standing in a darkened void. And this woman, Marianne Wickman, 
she tells me about the magic spell I did last night, and that's of the devil. And I helped split over 100 churches, and that's of the devil. And I've done over 100 abortions, and that's of the devil. And she tells me about nine or 10 other sins, and she ends everything with, and that's of the devil. And I want to open my hand up and drop this metal. But what happens if I fall through this darkened void and can't find my way back to my mall? I also wanted to attack this woman with magic, but her magic is stronger than mine. I could have been the only one high wizard out of seven billion people. I didn't have the power to give somebody else a gold-colored worthless piece of tin, transport both of us to a darkened void, and know all their sins. She's much stronger than I am. And she says again, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. And instantly, I knew that was the Mother of God. It had to be a grace by the Holy Spirit because a former Baptist would never say Mother of God. And when I knew it was the Mother of God, Mary appeared. She was the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. And she smiled at me. And it was a smile I knew I did not deserve. I was acutely aware of my 146 assisted abortions at that moment. And she took me by the hand and she turned me around. Divine Mercy Jesus was standing behind me. I didn't know what Divine Mercy was. I just suddenly have these rays of light going around me and over me and under me and through me. And I knew instantly I did not sell my soul to the devil when I was 13. I knew that Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior. I knew all my magic, my occult, my Satanism, and my new age was false. And I knew everything Catholic was truth. And the Blessed Mother told me that my job was to help her end abortion. And I opened my hand. I'm back in my store, back in my mall. This woman, Marianne Wickman, still talking to me. She tells me where she goes to Mass. While she's talking to me, her daughter comes up to the counter. And she says, could you go up to the truck and bring this man one of each of everything? So her daughter disappears. Now, I wasn't Catholic yet, so I didn't know what one of each of everything meant. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> and while we're talking, she tells me that she's Father Joe Whalen's personal assistant in the St. Raphael Healing Oil Ministry. While she's talking to me, her cell phone rings. She looks at it. She goes, this is Father Joe. I got to take it. I'm like, yeah, go ahead. You just told me he's the busiest priest you know. Take the call. So she talks to him. Now, at that time, Father Joe was going deaf, so he talked like everybody else was going deaf. <laughs> so I heard everything he said on the phone. He says, can you hand the phone to the young man you're talking to? He's like, sure thing, Father Joe. So she hands me the phone. And I'm like, hello? Welcome to the faith. Hand the phone back to Marianne. <laughs> so I hand the phone back. We get two more phone calls like that. Then her daughter comes in and has this paper grocery bag filled to the brim. Why do Catholics believe this or do that? A Catholic Bible and like 125 Lighthouse Catholic media discs. <laughs> and she gives me the address of where she goes to Mass. And I start going there the next day. And I brought a friend with me. And at the consecration, I saw Jesus on the altar. And I thought everybody in the audience saw the same thing. I just thought if you were Catholic, you were seeing Jesus. I thought this is the best kept secret for me in the world. I mean, had I known as a child that Jesus was really in this church, I'd have been here and you would have had to drug me out. You would have had to have made me a priest because I wasn't gonna leave. And I just, it was amazing. And then, and I asked my friend, I said, did you see that? She was what? I said, that man up, up there on the stage. She was, that's the priest. I said, no, the other guy. She was, no. I said, you didn't see it because you're not Catholic. <laughs> yeah, I thought I was Catholic already. <laughs> so then I found out there was this place called Perpetual Adoration. And I could go see Jesus anytime I wanted. And I was like, is there a sign-up sheet for that? Do you have to wait? So like they call you, like you give your name and phone number and they call you and there's an opening? 
No, you just go. I'm like, there's no way. There's a line to get in to see Elvis, and he's been dead over 40 years. <laughs> so I go to that. Shock number one, we are the only other car in the parking lot. Shock number two, there's no line to get in. Shock number three, we open the chapel door, and it's me, my friend, this woman that we don't know, and Jesus. This woman looks up like a deer in the headlights, and she starts packing as fast as she can go. And she tells us, now this was an Olympic event, she got gold. And she said, you can't leave till someone else comes in, and bam, she's out the door. <laughs> And I thought, why would I leave? I'm in a room with Jesus. So I started hanging out there anywhere from 30 minutes to 18 hours a day. Wow. It is the best sleep I ever got one night. I got to tell you, priests, close your ears. At least once in your lifetime, go to the Adoration Chapel and take a nap. It is the best nap you ever get. It is the most peaceful, it's joyful, it's amazing. But I would appreciate it if when you're caught, if you don't tell the priest, Zachary King said it was okay. <laughs> when I was doing that, the uh, St. Raphael decided they'd look for me as spiritual director. And they found Father Anthony Gramlich He's the rector for the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. I went to him the first time and met with him for three hours. And he said, I at least needed a deliverance, but I might need an exorcism. So I went back to Monsignor Valley. That was my priest that was bringing me into the church. And I told him that. And he said, well, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Whatever demon might have been with you at the time of your conversion, that when Mary and Jesus showed up, that scared the hell out of that demon. He said, so I'm going to think you don't have anything, but I'll do a deliverance in case you have a curse or anything on you. So I did have some gifts at that time that I thought were godly, but how could I think that I was a Satanist? And I could see demons and angels. And when I got my deliverance, I could no longer see that. And I was actually very grateful because both are very scary. And Monsignor Lavalle worked with me. Instead of me going to RCIA, I went to see Monsignor. And I saw him anywhere from 30 minutes a day to three hours, and anywhere from one day a week to seven days a week. And he brought me fully into the church in May of 08. I was given the medal in January of 08. And I started going to adoration, like I said, between 30 minutes a day and 18 hours a day. And I had the most blessed conversations ever with Jesus in adoration. And one day I was sitting there, and it just occurred to me at my conversion, Mary said I had to help her end abortion. So I was like, uh, Jesus, your mom told me that I had to help her end abortion, but I don't know how. I can stop myself. I can't stop the world. And he says, oh, wait a minute. So I waited a minute, and then Mary showed up. And what she said was very short, very profound. She said, use what you know. And she left. Use what I know. Well, I know abortion is a satanic sacrifice. I know that the blood of abortion fuels Satan's machine. And I know how to shut down that machine. I know that when I was doing abortions, rosaries stopped my abortions. 
I know that the holiest tool in the Catholic Church or in the world is the Mass. If you could bring a Mass to the abortion clinic, you would stop it. Amen. What would be the greatest thing to bring to a battle? Jesus. So if you brought a Eucharistic procession, people praying rosaries, and an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe who's pregnant with Jesus, to the battle, you'd win. And I originally was going to do a DVD project. I wrote up the transcript. It was all done. Six different companies told me that they could do the graphic design in my DVD. But every time I would call one to say, it's your turn, you're up, they can't do it. Six different companies couldn't do it. So it turned into a CD project. First was one CD, now it's two. And then so many people, when that came out, they wanted the transcript of that. So I did the transcript, but I also added some extra things in the book that aren't in the CD. Like, for example, Einstein's definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. We decided that we would march on Washington and write new laws. And that's great. You have to march because you have to demonstrate to the world that this is unacceptable. No one should be willing to do this kind of stuff and be able to sleep at night. So you have to march. But you got to fight in other ways. It's a spiritual warfare battle. You can't fight a spiritual warfare battle physically. It doesn't work. You want proof that it doesn't work? We send over one million people now to march but abortion mills are still open. We could probably send all 7 billion people in the world to march. Abortuaries would still be open tomorrow. Doesn't seem to work. We write new laws every year. We write new laws and we march. And it didn't work this year, we're gonna try it again next year. Doesn't work next year, we're gonna try it again the next year. Hasn't worked yet, but we keep doing it because that's all we know. I bring a new method. You know, I was working with, there's a woman that was possessed in Los Angeles. She called me one day and she was screaming at me with three different voices. Three different messages at the same time coming out of her at the same time. I told her I would get her an exorcist and help her. And it might be a couple of days. So I called my friend Terry Barber and I said, I need to know the exorcist number for Los Angeles. And he gave me the number. He said, when you call, first thing out of your mouth has to be, Terry Barber gave me your number. And then give him your name and he'll call you back. So I did that. This exorcist called me back. And I said, I've got a woman, she's possessed and this is going on. And he says, what makes you think she's possessed? I said, she screamed at me with three different voices at the same time. He goes, hey, that's a sign. So I said, you know, I know you're busy. You're the exorcist for Los Angeles. This might take a minute. And he says, um, I'll work her in by this weekend. I said, whoa, I can't believe how busy you must be. How do you have time to do that? And he said, well, I owe you a favor. I said, I, I don't even know you, Father. And he said, well, I've been fighting the abortuaries for a minute, and um, Jesse Romero gave me your CD set, and I realized I've been fighting the wrong way. He said, so this, uh, my, one of my parishioners has a van, and he pulls up into the parking lot every day. And if a spot opens up in front of the abortuary, he calls me, and then I show up, and I get in the back of the van. And I do a mass and an exorcism. And we've been doing that for under a year now. And the abortion clinic went from being open seven days a week to being open three. And they went from doing 77 abortions a week to doing zero. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. 
And he said, that's you. That's your methods. I am grateful to you. If I hadn't gotten this CD, we'd still be struggling. So the funny thing about that story is that I was presented, it was like a dream, but it was like a dream while I was awake. And it was the Blessed Mother showing me what I needed to say to somebody about a van and what to do. And I thought, how am I going to tell people to do that? And then this priest told me that story. And I was like, thank you, God. I can just tell people that story. Last time I was here, I told that story. And you guys listened. You guys took it to heart. And you guys are doing masses in vans at abortion mills. And that's an awesome thing. And one more awesome story. In, I think it was 2017, I went to a spiritual warfare conference with Father Gary Thomas in Toronto. And this is, there's an article about this talk on LifeSite News where I told how to shut down an abortion mill. But the same day as that was happening, my bishop was at an abortion mill. He did a Eucharistic procession. There's a wonderful picture of the Eucharist in a monstrance with a light shining from the heavens. It's not shining on anybody else, but it's hitting the monstrance. And he does an exorcism and a mass. There's a bunch of priests out there. There's a bunch of people out there. It's an event. And then that was in October. A couple of months later, we're at midnight mass. It's the Latin mass. My friend Jennifer is sitting beside me, and she's all of a sudden poking me in the ribs, trying to whisper something to me. Mass hasn't started yet. And I was like, what, what are you, what? And she said, Leslie Page is sitting on the back pew. Whoa, Leslie Page is the abortion doctor. She's at my Latin mass, Christmas mass. And we sit through the mass, and they're all beautiful. When the mass is over, we go up to Leslie Page, find out what is she doing here. And she said she hadn't been to Latin mass in 57 years. And she had the burning desire. She could have gone to any mass that night. Her husband wanted to take her to a different mass. But she came to this one instead. She is no longer an abortion doctor. So if you want to know what the power of the Mass and the Eucharist and an exorcism are at an abortion clinic, they make an abortion doctor that she's old. She's been doing it for a while. They made her stop and come back to Latin Mass. And that is a mighty thing. Think of all the people that she could influence now. <coughs> Think of the lives she's saving now. Think how happy the angels are now with her. Imagine if we showed up in Washington for the march to celebrate that none of the abortion clinics were open. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing? Amen. Amen. I've been doing this since October. That was the first time I actually officially got hired to speak on my own. Before that, I worked with St. Raphael, but not in an official capacity. And when Mary told me it was my time to step out on my own, I had to find the name, a cool name for a ministry. Well, I had a Good devotion, Benedict was my confirmation name. I really love St. Benedict. And I really love Padre Pio. Mm -hmm. And I love Blessed Bartolo Longo. For those of you that don't know, he had been a Satanist and then a Satanic high priest 
and then he became a Catholic priest, and then he was worried that he was going to go to hell, and the Blessed Mother told him that anybody that promotes her rosary will not go to hell. So he went the extra mile and built a basilica to the rosary. And I'm thinking he didn't go to hell. And, um, and of course, you know, I really love the Blessed Mother, but the, the Blessed Mother, Blessed Bartolo Longo, St. Benedict, Padre Pio ministry doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> and then I was learning about new saints almost every day. And I thought by the time I've learned about all the saints, my business card is going to have to be the size of a billboard. But then I thought, we're all about inclusion nowadays. So I came out with All Saints Ministry. That way, not only do I have all the saints in heaven now, but when the people get from purgatory to heaven, I have all those new saints. Any of you that become saints, Jennifer? Uh -uh. <laughs> I, I have, you know, all you people as saints. I'll have everybody. Now, eventually, yes, I'll have to die. Maybe I'll be a saint. Maybe I can help the next person that carries along my ministry. But traveling the world like I do, I meet awesome people like you. Thank you for inviting me. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Uh, we'll have Zach back in a few minutes for questions and answers. And when we do that, I ask you to come up uh, close here. I'll hold the microphone and hand it to you. You can ask your question and we can, uh, Zach can answer it. Maybe a good spot right over next to Missy. So Missy, stand up so everybody can see you. That's where you're gonna come up and ask your questions. That way it'll get on the video. Uh, <clears throat> couple of housekeeping announcements. Remember, every priest, seminarian, and deacon gets one. Oops. Well, it's wood. <laughs> that was the next announcement. No. It's made of olive wood. It's really solid. So be sure you get one of those. Afterwards, for those of you who don't get a freebie, uh, you'll be selling his book for $10, excuse me, $15, two for 30, by the way. Um, and <clears> that's <throat> supposed to be a joke, by the way. And also his CDs. So he's got a lot of them. It'd be a shame if he has to take them back to Kansas. And fill out those cards, if you would. We'll have some baskets coming around to uh, collect them. And we'll have that drawing after the question and answer period. Uh, Remember what he said, and Missy said, it's, what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is to have masses celebrated at these abortuaries. And that's what we're doing here in the Maryland, D.C. area. We've had 33 such masses in the last two years, and it's working. That infamous abortionist, Leroy Carhart, is no longer coming. So good things are happening. That's how we're going to shut down abortion, and abortion. And after we end it in America, we have the rest of the world. So <clears throat> anyway, it's great that you're all here. Again, I'd like to thank all of you who came, all of you who did so much to make this happen. We have about 70 people here. That's great. Half of them are priests, seminarians. You know, seminarians are the future priests. Boy, they, isn't that great? We have the Society of St. John, the Legionaries of Christ, lots of other uh, religious and diocesan priest here. By the way, is anybody here from the Archdiocese of Baltimore? Priest, religious, or seminary? Oh, very good, very good. Okay, uh, I think that's it. Who has, has the first question? Come up and ask Zach that question. I'll walk over here with a microphone.
Hi, Zachary. It's Kim Fraser. We met yesterday, and um, what advice do you give to um, someone, if you know someone who's cutting themselves, how to deal with that um, spiritually? And then what advice would you give for those of us at the front lines to um, any other advice to protect ourselves spiritually and also the use of blessed salt and holy water? For someone that's cutting themselves, blood is an agent of God in the Old Testament. Blood was like a binding agent. So Satan uses it the same way. Blood sacrifices attract demons to you. So even though the person may not be aware exactly of what they're doing, they cut themselves and they feel worse. Spiritually, they feel worse. Now, a lot of the cutters cut themselves because they're not feeling anything. And when they cut, they feel alive. They realize that they still have feeling somewhere. But the more blood they bleed, the more demons they attract. Personally, the strongest tool that I have is the rosary. Hail Marys do a lot of damage to the devil. But the strongest tool we have as a church is the mass. So having perpetual masses said for anyone is a great gift. And they say having one mass said for somebody while they're alive is a mighty thing. Well, I go to St. John Cantius in Chicago online and I buy perpetual masses. For an individual, it's $30. For a group, it's $100. But it's 365 Latin masses every year till either they don't exist or Jesus comes back. Now, a lot of people think Jesus' coming is just around the corner, and that may be true. But, you know, most things in the Bible happen in threes, sevens, and forties. In the Old Testament, it says that to God, a thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years. Based on that, Jesus was here two days ago. He might have one day to go. So if that's the case, Jesus doesn't come back for another thousand years and the canons regular stays open, you could have 365,000 masses said for somebody. I'm thinking that's a wonderful thing. But that's a great help. Um, all right, what was the, the other question? The use of the blessed uh, salt and exorcism, holy water? Um, if you can find the person that is in authority over the person and they can bless them with um, holy water or holy oil, then that is a mighty thing. It puts them under a protection. Um, exercise salt is a great tool. You know, you can use that around your house. Um, two wonderful stories about exercise salt. One was a woman put it, uh, her daughter was having some issues. She wasn't sure what they were. And so at night while her daughter slept, she snuck into her room and put exercise salt all around her bed. When the daughter woke up in the morning, she called her mom in a panic. Her mom came into the bedroom to see what was going on. Daughter said she couldn't get off the bed. It was like there was a wall right there. It was blocking her. She couldn't go past it. And she wanted her mom to call a priest. So the priest showed up and heard the girl's confession. 
suddenly she could get off the bed. Same woman was a psychologist, and she was going to repaint her office. And she asked me about that. She asked me about protection, because her office, although she's Catholic, the entire building is New Age. And these people come into her office every Friday. She, cook, she bakes cookies, and then they all come in her office on Friday and take a cookie, and they have conversation. But they're talking New Age, and she's talking Catholicism. So I told her, if you're going to paint the walls, put some exercise salt in the paint. So she did that. She did that on the weekend. Monday through Thursday, these people leave her alone, same as they always do. Friday, everybody showed up at the door of her office. Nobody would walk in. So there was something about it. They couldn't walk in there. Can you bring the cookies out here? No. <laughs> So she got to take all the cookies home because none of these people would walk into her room. You know, demons are extremely uncomfortable with certain things. They don't like the miraculous medal. They don't like St. Benedict medals. They don't like the divine mercy image. You know, they don't like, the, obviously they hate the Blessed Mother. Um, exercise salt holy water, holy oil, sacraments and sacramentals, they're not big fans of, you know? And if we, we have all the tools to defeat the devil, you know, one of the things that the devil is most afraid of is a well-informed Catholic. Next question. How do you uh, how do you feel about uh, the masses in vans? Have these been approved by our bishops? Ours have. Yes, we, ours have. Father, uh, I mean the Bishop Fisher, Mike. approved two years ago. Yeah. Yeah, because that's so so important for us to be one united force. Because Catholic Church is the true Church, and that's the only one that's powerful in exorcism. But we, one has to be delegated cannot do whatever they want to do, have to be under complete obedience of the bishop I for agree. it to work. Otherwise, we would be wasting it, our time. It, it would be like an exorcist not getting the bishop's permission exactly. and doing the exorcism. Hell, hell is united in one force against us. Right. We must be united as one. Cannot be divided. They will have to obey everybody from the pope all the way down. We cannot be a source of divisions. Otherwise, Satan will attack us. Thank now, you. Jack likes to say that the devil doesn't sleep, but remember, neither does God. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another question here. Yes, please. Oh, by the way, Bishop Fisher, who is an auxiliary here, is not the Bishop of Buffalo. Pray for him, because he has a mess history now. And we have a question. I don't know how you're hearing three after all of this. Mm. Were they converted? No, my, um, my dad, my, I, I describe my parents as devout Baptists. That means they never went to church. Um, my dad knew that I was involved in something bad, and he knew when I came out being Catholic. I was almost scared to tell him I was Catholic, because when I was a kid, when I was eight years old, I would get a ride to school and walk home. And both ways, I passed a Catholic church. And, you know, my parents, well, one summer, I came out from the Baptist church, and my dad asked me what we did today at church. And I said, we colored a picture. Well, that wasn't holy enough for my dad. So he took me around to all the other Protestant churches in town every Sunday, went to a different church. And at the end of all of them, you know, we colored a picture, we played find a word, we played connect the dots. You know, it was everything. It was like a little childish thing. And he realized that all the churches do the same thing at the same age. So he'll just take me back to the Baptist church because that's where we grew up. And one day I was walking home from school and there was this group of women and men outside the Catholic church. You know, I was always trying to figure out which one of those men was married to which one of those women. I couldn't figure it out. At my church... The pastor wore a nice suit, and his wife wore a flowery dress. Well, at this one, women wore brown 
black or blue dresses that went from the top of their head down to the ground. And the men wore a black jacket and a black shirt, white collar and black pants, or they wore foot pajamas. I, I didn't know what a cassock was. I, so one day there was this nun outside and she looked like if you looked up love in the dictionary, her picture would have been there. And I ran up and I gave her a hug. She knelt down, she hugged me back, she gave me the longest hug. And I held on for a long time and then I looked up and my friends are way off in the distance. So I tear away from her and I run off to be with them. But the next day, I wanna know what this church is because it has a bell out in front of it that we hear like four times a day. It has a crucifix, we have a cross, I don't know the difference. It's got stained glass windows, we have stained glass windows. But my dad never brought me to this building. Why not? So when we're driving by in the morning, I was like, Dad, 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 what is that building? <sighs> it's the Catholics. <laughs> I can read the sign. What's a Catholic? It doesn't matter. They're all going to hell. <laughs> so when I converted to being Catholic, I thought, ooh, this isn't going to go well. And I told him, and he was like, oh, you guys believe Jesus is God, right? Like, yeah. He goes, yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm like, Dad, you told me this when I was a kid. He goes, oh, well, I was dumb, and I learned some stuff along the way. Okay. But my dad was dying from like 19 different things, and I was afraid that if I told him, oh, by the way, Dad, I, I was a Satanist for 26 years, and I did 146 assisted abortions, and you know, and all this evil stuff, I was afraid that would push him over the edge and I'd be responsible for killing him. So, and I didn't want that. So I never told my dad what I did. But he knows now. He died in 2014. Um, my mother received all of her sacraments and the only one she didn't get was marriage because she converted to being Baptist so she could marry my dad. And then eventually, later in life, when she had six and a half years to go, she got dementia. And she got Lewy body dementia. It's associated with Parkinson's disease. And she got out of the house three times. And my dad had to call the sheriff's office to find her. And the sheriff would find her. And then you can't just take them and throw them in the car because that's a recipe for violence. You had to convince them that they wanted a ride. And so they asked her what she was looking for. All three times, she said she was looking for a Catholic church. So I told that to my priest, and he said, well, she believes she's Catholic. She's got dementia. God would recognize her as Catholic, but she can't take the Eucharist. So we started bringing her to daily mass. All the priests fell in love with my mom. She's like this really short Puerto Rican lady and uh, really feisty. And all the, the parishioners love my mom. She always had a big smile for everybody. You know, and we also had a, a Spanish mass. And she loved to speak Spanish. It was really funny. When she spoke Spanish, she spoke fine. You couldn't tell she had dementia. When she spoke English, totally didn't make a lick of sense. So we've got all this happening. And then we heard that we might could get my mother absolution. You know, that would be awesome. And this is about three years before she died. So we went to the priest, Father Bradus, and we asked him, what has to happen to get my mom absolution? And he says, well, your mother would have to have a moment of lucidity and would have to understand what we're talking about. And if she understood what we're talking about and we can do a confession, I can give her absolution. Well, I was kind of crestfallen because, you know, the same God that, gave me a former Satanist, a blessed miraculous medal, and then had Mary and Jesus show up at my conversion. I doubted that, that God that could do all that could make my mother lucid enough to bring her out and get her absolution. I, I, don't, I don't know why that, that was even a, a consideration, but I just didn't think, I mean, she'd had dementia for a while by that point. And we walked out the back of the church and it was me and Father Bradis and my friend Katie. 
And my mom is sitting in a wheelchair talking to some friends. And <laughs> Father Bredis walks up to my mom and he says, Anna, we're going to see if we can get you to take the Eucharist again soon. And she said, that would be wonderful. It's been such a long time. And he said, good enough for me. <laughs> oh, what a great answer. <laughs> hey, before we go back to the next question, fill out that card if you have not already done so. And there's some wonderful volunteer opportunities. But we, if you're not already on our list, we please take your name, address, email, phone number, um, physical address. Because right after, the last question and answer was going to give away this beautiful wood carving of Brennan and Brennan this time of our Lord Jesus Christ carved from olive wood in the Holy Land. So fill those out and just hold them up and then somebody will come along around and collect them. Who has the next question? Yes. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, what they feel is hatred or extreme sickness, and it's believed that that's caused by the love of God. They are so against the love of God that it makes them sick. And they can tell that in the consecrated host. The funny thing about that is when somebody steals a host, which is generally done because so many Nova Soto churches receive in the hand, because you can't steal a host that's been given in the mouth, now it's been used. You can't sell that, but you can sell one that's been given in the hand. Um, the cheapest those you generally sell for is about $1,500. If they're desperate, they'll pay as much as $15,000 for it. The average used to be about $5,000. Because you have to give your 30 pieces of silver to G for Jesus. Um, and Satanist groups are willing to pay that. And I tell people, you know, what would stop you from, other than you're a good Catholic, well, let's say you weren't a good Catholic. What would stop you from going to a Catholic bookstore buying a box of unconsecrated hosts for about 10 bucks, a nice suborum would be like 325. Buy that, put them together, go to a satanic temple somewhere and say, hey, you know, I know you guys pay between 1,500 and $15,000. Today only, I'll sell you 100 of them for $100,000. What would stop you from being able to do that? Because they can feel of them and know they're unconsecrated. They wouldn't buy them. And they'd probably put a curse on you on top of that. By the way, before we take the next question, anybody here, anybody watching on Facebook Live, be aware that we are videotaping this entire presentation and within probably a week it'll be posted at defendlight.org. Take that video, watch it again, and send it to all your friends. Who has the next question? For that. Thanks for changing your presentation. I had a question harking back to the beginning of your presentation where you spoke about the different um, curses that you did for, or spells that you did for the sake of these different rock stars through the mediation of the Illuminati. I was wondering if you could just expand on that, specifically in the role of energy in the entertainment industry and the specific ways that the Illuminati um, helps to facilitate that. 
The Illuminati is a satanic organization. They have their own agenda and they kind of use Satanists to move it forward, but Satanism also uses the Illuminati to move their agenda forward as well. Uh, the Illuminati also works with Freemasons. At, there's a place in California called Bohemian Grove and the Freemasons provide security. It's an Illuminati event. Um, the Illuminati, for those that don't know, in politics, they kind of push the buttons and pull the levers of power. You know, they, they're the ones that shift billions side to side and um, moving Satan's agenda around the world. And Satan's agenda generally is abortion. Um, for some reason, they claim that murdering babies clears up pollution and makes poverty go away. I've never known those things to work, but we keep pushing it. And I, we, I mean collectively as, as a world, we kind of buy into it. Oh yeah, if we murder our babies, these great things will take place. Uh, they've never taken place and poverty gets worse seems like maybe if we stopped murdering babies, then maybe God would reward us. But you can't outdo God in charity. Amen. I mean, imagine if we got rid of abortion, how much better life would be everywhere. But for rock stars, people know that for the most part, all rock stars got their start through the Illuminati. And there's um, a documentary with Lady Gaga where not in the documentary itself, but on the edits that were taken out, which are hard to find. But if you find them, she'll tell you she performed in a strip club. And she wasn't a stripper. She was Lady Gaga. You know, she was singing. But she was performing in a strip club. When she exited at the end of the night, there was a guy waiting for her out the back of the building. And he asked her if she wanted to be famous. And he said, if you sell your soul to the Illuminati, we'll make you a rock star. So she said, yes. Now that's on tape. Um, Katy Perry said in an interview, she wanted to be the next Amy Grant, but she failed. So she sold her soul to the devil. That's mainstream. Bob Dylan said on 60 Minutes that he sold his soul to the devil, made a deal, and he's performing his end, he's holding up his end of the bargain. You know, by performing every day if he can. You know, these are mainstream big name artists on a mainstream TV telling people outright they sold their soul to the devil. So people see that and they know if I expect to be famous, I mean, I can work hard at it, but I'll never be as famous as Bob Dylan if I don't sell my soul the same as him. That's where the Illuminati comes along. They let you know, you sign a deal with us. I would do a warehouse deal where I show up in Hollywood or LA and I go to a warehouse all these people that want to be famous already know about this event. The high wizard shows up, walks around and looks for who wants to be famous. Everybody says they want to be famous. Well, what are you willing to do to be famous? So, well, most people will say, well, nothing with animals, nothing with kids. Well, I got bad news for you because you're not who Satan wants. Satan wants the person that's willing to jump in the mud and be drugged through it. You're willing to do that, and you're willing to do anything to be famous? Mm. If you're willing to do anything, I'm gonna give you what's called a tier two card. And that card, it's a white card with a phone number on it. You call the number on that card, and they'll set up an appointment with you. And most likely it's gonna be filmed, and you're gonna be embarrassed, probably sick to your stomach, think that you're a disgusting, foul human being when you're done. But in six months, I'm going to see you on MTV. 
you're going to be a rock star. Some people don't blink an eye. They're like, yeah, I'll do that. Some people do blink an eye. Those people, I never saw them on MTV. But everybody that's a rock star, everybody that's famous, had to do something that most of us might throw up if we saw. Who has the next question? Mayor Jack. Mayor Jack. Mayor Jack. Let me hear you for the benefit of the I just wanted to get your opinion on Harry Potter, your current opinion on Harry Potter. Harry Potter. It's my favorite question. I got a call one day from a bishop who said that he was promoting Harry Potter and a bunch of the parishioners in his diocese gave him my card, said he had to call me. After his conversation with me, he pulled all the books. Um, I had a friend named Father Christopher Crotty, C-R-O-T-T-Y. He was an exorcist in the Fathers of Mercy in Kentucky, and he traveled the world speaking. He said that one year he had 11 cases of exorcism in the entire year, and the next year, he had 11 cases of exorcism in the summer. And during that summer, those 11 people, there was a guy that was homeless that lived in a box in an alley. Up to, there was a guy that lived in a mansion. There were people that had like no money. Up to, the guy in the mansion was a millionaire. There were adults, there were children. There were some people that belonged to the gym, some people had never been in a gym. These people were all over the gamut. I mean, they did, everything was different. None of them knew each other, all in the same area. They're all possessed. And the one thing that all of them had in common is that they all had all the Harry Potter books up until that point. He didn't know anything about Harry Potter until he was working on like the seventh case. And up until then, the six people previous had Harry Potter. And then the seventh one did. And then the eighth one did. And then the ninth one did. And then he started making his own CDs about against Harry Potter. Now, I did a spiritual warfare conference in 2016 in January. And it was um, in Los Angeles, and it was the Terry and Jesse show hosted it. And there was an exorcist there, and he told a bunch of stories. And one of the stories he told is that he was friends with Father Chad Ripperger. And I guess Father Ripperger told him a story about he did an exorcism one time, and when the demon manifested, he had to identify himself. And the demon said he was one of the six. Well, that doesn't say who it is. is. Do you have another name? What is one of the six? One of the six what? And he said that J.K. Rowling's asked through automatic writing to become possessed so that she could write a hit series. Mm -hmm. And she got possessed by six demons. And those six demons wrote Harry Potter. <laughs> Okay, two more questions. Who is the next to last question? Thank you, Zach, for doing what you're doing, and it's given me a great deal of hope that we're actually on to something here. I'd like your opinion on something that really was settled into my spirit a number of years back. It was Exodus 34, 20 says, But the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou redeem him not, then shalt thou break his neck. And our Lord, in my estimation, that Satan holds our Lord to the standard of his law. And unfortunately, if we're 
I think if we're remiss in anything as Catholics that the Protestants have over us is this calling to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and thus the transformation of the heart that enables a person to be redeemed first. But I say that and what I'm getting at here is that it seems to me, and maybe I'd love your opinion on this, that Satan is able to continue this slaughter of our unborn because the law demands it. If, if the person is not redeemed, then it must break the neck of the firstborn, so to speak, and he holds that. And, and so I'm just, I'm wondering, uh, is it not also a part of the answer solution here that we go out and bring these, beat the highways and the byways to be able to bring people to Christ? Is. I, I think another um, great tool of Protestants is that they are not ashamed or afraid to go up to a stranger's door and knock on it. You know, the, for all the faults of some of the cults we have in the country, the Jehovah's Witnesses have a great plan. Now, they unfortunately don't believe that Jesus is God, and they believe that he is St. Michael the Archangel. But, and they don't believe in hell. Even though they say they take the Bible literally and there's 93 references to hell. Um, but they plan and they know where they've, where they've been, where they're going, what houses they need to knock on, which ones they have to bring back friends because they were able to stand up to them with courage, who they need to work harder on, who they need to work less on, and who did they convert? We don't do any of that. You know, it, it's almost like we think, or oh, if they really want salvation, they'll come to us. Well, obviously that doesn't work. I mean, we used to have 1.3 billion members. And we got 85% of our church doesn't believe in the true presence. I mean, if the true presence is just a piece of bread then there are 66,000 Protestant denominations you can belong to. But if it truly is the body and blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're the only game in town. But because so many people don't believe that, we don't evangelize. We're commanded to do that by Jesus, but we don't. You know, I don't know if you people realize this, but on Judgment Day, you are responsible for what you did and what you didn't do. You know, I just made a video recently that says, I got enough stuff to answer for for myself. I don't want to answer for your sins too. So it's not, it won't bother me to walk up to a stranger on the street and tell him, hey, you know that's a sin? You know you're not supposed to do that? Now, you can't attack that person. You can't beat them over the head with the Bible. You got to say it in a nice way. You got to make sure that the love in your heart comes out and they can see it because it's your love is what's going to win them. You know, when you go to an exorcism, heaven forbid some of you have to go sometime, the priest that's doing it cannot exorcise that person unless he loves them. That's why you bring muscle with you, because it's hard to love somebody that's beating the crap out of you. But if you can love the person, the devil will flee. Last question. I just wanted to ask you if there was a time in the United States when Satanism or occultic activity was actually illegal. Do you know? I imagine there was, but I mean, our country is so twisted that there is, you know, our Supreme Court has approved things mm -hmm. along the way that they had no business approving or deciding against either. I mean, you know, we at one point decided that certain human beings were only half human, you know, are three quarters of a human being. Women didn't have the right to vote. Now we got gay marriage. I mean, they redefined God's law. So they apparently have overstepped their bounds and authority. 
Um, you know, when our, when our country founded, I think Catholicism was illegal. Um, I would imagine at some point probably Satanism was illegal, but probably not over the entire country. I would just wherever possibly it was a problem. Um, it should be illegal now, but, you know, for, for the longest time, when I first came out of Satanism, I told people about these satanic conventions that happened all around the world, and they happened in the United States. And people heard that message and said, oh, no, that stuff doesn't really happen. That, you know, Satan's not that bold. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, you were, you were having residual effects from taking acid or... Uh, you were just hallucinating, or you dreamed it, or you made it up, you're lying about it. But, you know, Satanism, you know, there's, there's not that many people that are Satanists in the world. And, you know, that Lucian Greaves recently said that there's, he's the head of the Satanic Temple, recently said there's 300,000 members in the Satanic Temple. So the person that said there wasn't many said there was less than 10,000 in the world. So... Now we find out that the Satanic Temple has 300,000, and they just had SatanCon this weekend in Arizona. And people were calling me like in a panic, like, what are we going to do? How are we going to solve this? I said, well, you had the way to solve it starting in January of 08 when I came out and told you about it, and you said I was wrong. Now suddenly you hear I'm right, and now you're in a panic? You had 14 years to shut it down. This reminds me of the way we fight the abortion industry. Do you know when Planned Parenthood opened? 1916. It was open for like 56 years before abortion was ever legal because Satan saw the writing on the wall and knew this was coming. But what did we say? Oh, that's never going to happen. That's not going to happen. Somebody's dreaming. Uh, you know, Satan's not that bold. That'll never happen. And, you know, if it happens, we'll fight it when it opens up. Well, how's that working for you? You know, uh, that, you know, like I said before, we march and we write little laws. Oh, that didn't work. Let's do it again next year. All right, didn't work that time. Well, let's do it again next year. All right, didn't work that time. Let's do it again next year. We've been doing it now for 50 years. So waiting to fight it when it opens didn't work. And marching and writing new laws doesn't work. But I brought you a message from heaven of how to shut it down. Yeah. Thank you, Zach. <laughs> By the way, Zach will be here selling his books and CDs, and you can ask him additional questions. But let's do two things right now. Let's pick the winner, Kathy Roth, Canada's gift to the United States for life movement. And to us. And who? And to us. Well, and Missy, yeah. read the name of the winner of this beautiful wood carving. Missy Smith. Oh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, Janice Lee. Where's Janice? Oh. Janice.